The views expressed and the opinions given by the individual host and their guests do not necessarily reflect those of Para-X, its affiliates, or its sponsors. Good evening and welcome to Illuminating the Paranormal, opening your mind to the possibility. Hope everyone is doing well tonight and it is kind of cold here in the Midwest. Uh, it's not snowing other than a little bit of uh, lake effect. Um, that's really about it going on there. And I wanted to let you guys know that this weekend I will be at the R Theater in Auburn, Illinois, for the Para Unity Day with Robin Terry. And unfortunately, I apologize, but it is completely sold out. It actually sold out last February. So if you guys are interested in coming to the R Theater, hearing some great speakers, getting to check the place out, and yes, it is haunted. <laughs> um, You'll need to do so right after this weekend. The tickets will go on sale. And as soon as I can get that link for you, I will pop it in there so you guys can buy some tickets to come check out a whole day at the R Theater. So I have tonight with me a friend, a good friend, and he is someone who has been doing some unbelievable things out there. Tonight, I have with me Robbie Thomas. He is a psychic medium uh, criminal profiler. He works closely uh, internationally with families and police, and he does this to bring solace to those who need it. He's also done uh, quite a few TV shows. He has been on many other different um radio shows. Robbie lives in Canada. He has published 10 books of his own already, and he's also co-contributed to four other books. And I just wanted to say, welcome. Robbie, how are you tonight? I am great. Thank you for having me. Good, good. And so I'm assuming Canada, you probably guys have a nice bank of snow down there. Actually, no. We are oh. the opposite. It's really weird up here right now. We're really? having our spring weather, and it started about a week ago. We, um, I think we had one little bit of snow, and then we started going plus four, which would be about maybe, say, almost 40 degrees. And we're stuck in the three and four range now. Um, just nice, nice days. I, I, you know, I can't get over it. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's been that way here. I'm actually in northern Indiana. I am about five minutes from the Michigan border. So, yeah, uh, that is what it's been here. Occasional lake effect, but uh, right. that's it. So, yeah. Uh, Loving it. Yeah, and you know what? They can hear you, Robbie. Apparently, I pushed the right button this week. Isn't oh, that good? good? <laughs> <laughs> We're in. <laughs> We're in. So the first time you and I ever met, now we had seen each other, I think, at some other shows, but the first time we ever met was Mid-South, I think, three years ago is when That's it was. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. And in fact, I have a fantastic picture I'll have to put up sometime for you guys to see. Robbie is doing a radio show interview, actually with um, somebody that is now on Para-X. And he was doing the show the whole time with this huge Queen of Hearts hat, top half <laughs> on his head, right. with a long <laughs> red train down the back. He looked awesome in it. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. I just thought you were the coolest back then. That's I was special. <laughs> special friend, that's true. Right. Yes, then let's yeah. do that. <laughs> so now you do a lot of going out, helping families 
to find loved ones that are lost. Um, I am assuming, though I'm going to ask now, do you ever not do the abduction but try and find a criminal that is, you know, that they can't find, that they can't locate? Do you also do that as well? Oh, yeah. I'm on, oh, well, before Christmas rolled around, I did four cases within a month. Um, mm. The month before, you know, everybody asked me, how many cases do you actually do? And I never tallied it up. It's just, you know, it's very many. So I'm chasing bad guys and I'm trying to find people who are lost. Mm. Um, it's something else when you're, you're dealing with drug teams out of Ventura, California, and a mother's son who was shot and bled to death in his apartment. And mm. then, then you're trying to find a man who's lost out of Mississippi, Alabama slash area. Yeah. And, you know, the clues and everything and the photographs that they send you. So working with law enforcement, they send me the files. And then, you know, go to Arkansas where the sheriff was two years in, nothing, didn't open the case. And mm. I gave all the information. And now we got that case reopened. And now they're looking at the people who were involved where they actually went into the trailer and pulled out bags and bags of uh, um, evidence. So, I mean, wow. that's a good thing. We got it all reopened. Yeah. Yeah. And that was that all before Christmas. That is great. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so, I've got to ask, because I, you know, I occasionally get to hear you being interviewed, but I don't always get to hear the answer because, well, frankly, people, when you're at a Paracon, you're working. <laughs> Or you're speaking in another room. So I have to ask, what got you started? Obviously, you have gift, but what made you decide this is what I need to do? Yeah, great question. Um, I went through to be a police officer twice. My okay. first time, I was 17. And I did all the psychological testing. I did all the physical testing. I did all the, the written and what have you. And over that barrage of, say, three, four days of doing that, and it was very cumbersome, but beating out candidates of 50 at a time or, or 100 um, during that one time in my hometown, by the way, um, mm -hmm. getting up and then finding being top three, and then I'm escorted wow. to the, the chief's office. And I'm sitting in the chair, and I'm I'm proud as a peacock. You know, I'm I'm a cop. That's all that's going through my mind. Yeah, yeah. I'm a I'm a cop, and I look over the other two, and and they're all you know congratulatory to everybody, and they're smiling and what have you. And then they hear the the chief come in. He's a big burly fella, and he comes around, and sits in his desk, and he's got the paper in his hand, and he congratulates the first two over there, but didn't say thank you and welcome to me. And then he looked at the paper and he says, "Son, how old are you?" I said, well, you know, chief, I'm 17. I still got that. I'm a cop in my head, right? And, right, right. Um, and uh, he laughed, and then they turned, and they started laughing, and he said, son, you got to come back when you're 20 to be an auxiliary. And so, you know, in hindsight, looking at that, you know, it was a, <laughs> it was a kick in the pants. And But, you know, it, it, it just pushed me harder. So I went back when I was 20. In a little town outside of Toronto, Canada, I got hired on in a big regional police force. And I come home, and I'm sitting in my kitchen, and I hear, accident, accident. So mm. I, I run out the back door. I hop up the top of my fence. I see a lady in her robe, and she's in the townhouses behind my house in the parking lot area. And she's pointing down, down the roadway. So I ran, and as I ran... I'm thinking car accident because that's what she told me, accident. And I'm I'm hoofing it. I'm getting all the way around this. The, the, the parking lot curves out to the road. I get the, and there's normal traffic. There's no yeah. accident. And then the guy to my left goes over here. So I see him in a threshold of uh, another set of townhomes on the screen door. So I run over and I step into the threshold into the kitchen. There's a lady running around the table screaming. There's a gentleman to my right holding a doorknob, and he says, come here. So I went over towards him, and now I'm still looking for blood on the floor. I'm looking for some yeah. sign of this accident. He opens the door, grabs my shoulder, shoves me, and shuts the door. So I'm looking down, and then I look up, and I see a gentleman, and there he is. And he's got his eyes pierced onto me, blue lips, and then I just knew as Ugh. a first responder, there's something definitely wrong here. I'm going over and yeah. checking for vitals. You know, and I can hear and see my whole life. So I'm checking for vitals. I hear, let me go. So now I back up a little bit, but it didn't dawn on me that, okay, this is what he's saying. But no, I'm thinking, 
I've got to save this man's life. That's always in, in my mindset, right. first responder. Yeah. So I go back, I check vitals again, and I go to do CPR, and I hear, let me go. And then I stood back, and I looked, and it was, sure, you know, I go, yeah, I heard you that time. And I stepped out of that washroom into the kitchen area, and there was two people in there. As I came out, there must have been 50 people in there, the neighbors and everybody, and everybody's just staring right at me. And that's when mm. I shook my head, and that's when – you know, the poop hit the fan and everybody's screaming and, you know, <sighs> bloody murder. Yeah. And um, wrong wow. move to shake your head. No. <laughs> <laughs> so it turns out oh. and this whole story it was my sister's best friend's father passed away. Oh. He had a massive coronary. The coroner said I wouldn't have been able to save him anyways, even if I did chest compressions or what happened. Right. Right. So I decided, I knew a long time ago that... There was some way in my life I'm going to help with law enforcement. So I decided I don't want to be a cop anymore. So here I got fired when I was 17, and now I'm quitting when I'm 20. And so, <laughs> you know, that's my extent, right? So I call, up the, I call up the police force, and I say, you know, I don't want to be a police officer no more. I, I just know I don't want to be a police officer. And you don't quit when they hire you and they go through all that extensive training and, and testing and, and, you know, you go right through the final brass and they cut out everybody but pick you. So they said, well, in exchange for this, you have to be in a working tool and it's about EMTs, firefighters and police officers who quit under duress. And I mm -hmm. thought, oh. Well, okay, it's a movie. I can handle this. No, no big deal. It's a documentary. Sure, I'll be part of it. So they send down a captain and a sergeant and a film crew from the Chatham Police Force, a different city. They were making this working tool. They come in my house. They set up, and there I am. You know, I'm sitting in a chair, and I once again, you know, just hear him in movies now. I'm going to police yeah. officer to a movie, and <laughs> yeah, right. So um, they ask all these barrage of questions, and they get to the main question, why did I quit? What made me change my mind? And mm -hmm. I said, well, he was speaking to me. And you should have seen everybody, even the sound person. Their, their eyes were just glaring, and they were just like no expression. And they're looking yeah. for a guy to cry and be under duress and say, this is why I can't handle it. And this, but I just knew. Um, yeah, so that's what my extent of being a police <laughs> officer. My first movie, I'm 20. I'm 54 now. Um, yeah, crazy. <laughs> so what, what kept you going with being a profiler? Well, I Why went on my, yeah, um, my first case was a very dark and um, scary case. And I'm telling everybody out there who thinks – or know they have ability. And do not put yourself in harm's way the way that this gentleman did myself. And it was very wrong. I'm standing in the parking lot with my good friend, and he's the manager of this complex. And over his shoulder, I see this gentleman walking across the parking lot, going to the, the entrance of the main entrance of the, the building. Mm -hmm. And I see a black shroud around him. Whenever I see oh. black, you know, it's bad. There's something yeah. evil about this person or something that they've done bad. So Greg notices my concentration isn't on him. It's on AKA Jesse. And this is the first case in the book. I wrote my book, psychic profiler, the real deal True crime cases, mm -hmm. volume one. Now, because I have to let everybody know where it all started. So it's in the book, and I think there's 15 cases in there. So everybody can get a good glimpse of from then till now. I had to pick okay. so many on forever, right? So right. there I am. Greg goes, oh, that's Jesse. Do you want to go in and meet him? And so by the time we had that conversation, we're up in Jesse's apartment meeting Jesse. So Jesse's sitting two feet from me. Greg's adjacent on another chair. And my line of questioning, because, you know, Here's this young, tough guy again going through to be a police officer. And my line mm -hmm. of questioning was direct and straight demeanor. Are you, you know, working? You got something wrong? What did you do? Right? And and this guy says, stand the F up. And I, <laughs> so I thought, what? And if you can picture a mini sawed-off Eddie Van Halen to a team, that's what <laughs> okay. this guy looked like. I'm not kidding. Wow. Yeah, not, not, I'm not kidding you. So now... Greg's getting Nancy over there. He stands up, 
his girlfriend was pregnant at the time. And she's pacing back and forth in the little alcove kind of uh, dining room, kitchen area by the living room. And um, he, she's starting to say, like, you know, shut up, don't say anything, blah, blah, blah. And he smacks her. I'll never forget mm-hmm. that. He smacked her so hard. She's pregnant. So now, you know, as a guy, I'm sitting there going, what are you doing? And so he, I'm, now I'm standing up. And he goes, are you effing hot? And I'm still trying to clue in on this black shroud. You just smacked her. What's going yeah. on? And he lifts my shirt up. He checks around my waistband. And then I knew uh-huh. he was looking for a white. A liar. Yep. Right. So he goes, you want to know? And he pushed me down. Now, Greg, by that time, standing up, he's scared. And Jesse's going, we were ripping off a, a, car, a car stereo across the way. And Thomas Cook, I mentioned one of the murderers, well, whatever, <laughs> and, and Jesse. <laughs> Um, yeah, there's a, there's another story about Thomas I'll get to in a second. Um, they went off to the, across the street to a little cubicle where this 14 year old little boy who came from Quebec to Ontario, Canada to go to school and his dad and mom moved to the city was making what I think back then maybe a dollar 65 an hour. And so okay. he pulled out a gun and if you could picture me holding my hand sideways, on on like a gangster style that's how he uh-huh. showed me and he was jerking it back and forth into him he's going and we popped him like this and he was hopping like a rabbit but when he said uh-huh. it he said it with a big smile on his face so uh-huh. i'm looking at him like that and then he started to explain the way they ran everything and then they get up and he goes um greg by then's at the door and he goes get in language get out so yeah i get up i go to the door and he's still vulgar language coming out of this little Eddie Van Halen. And he grabs me. He turns me around. He goes, if I tell anybody, if you tell anybody, I'm going to kill you. And that's what he did. He shut the door. So now I'm down in Greg's apartment with his wife, who's very upset at us for even going there. And then Greg goes, what are you going to do? I said, I'm going to talk to the detectives. So I go down and talk to the detectives. They wanted me to go back and befriend Jesse to wear a wire and they said the reason why, Rob, is we're in court right now with him over the murder of what he just told you. We need that confession. We need that. And I said, he made me, and there's no way I'm going back. And he, and they, they begged me. We drew up a plan. They wanted me to wear the wire. I backed out, and that was it. Yeah. However, yeah, so my for my first story of my illustrious career, if you will, to tell people out there, don't ever put yourself in harm's way because – it is something that you're going to end up getting killed. I mean, luckily, I'm still here because uh, this, you know, just wasn't him. We're talking about another guy who also went back and saran wrapped his girlfriend, <clears throat> held her arms so she couldn't breathe, and watched her die in front of him. And then he turned oh. himself in, and now he's in jail for like life. Yeah, it's um, um, it's crazy these these people out there. So that's what got me into doing what I wanted to do. And I moved on and then, you know, it's just been case after case. And um, it really took off in 2000, oh, 2000-ish, 2005. Yeah. Okay. Robbie, I do have a question from the chat room. Uh, uh, I have someone here with the name Big Bird. And they say, I would love to get into finding people, but I can't even get help on the one case that won't leave me alone. How did you get the door open so someone would believe in you? Good question. And, you know, that's the same question you get asked all the time for the last I bet. 20 years yeah. on every show, right? Yeah. It boils down to this is the credibility and being able to just not give certain items, but give detailed information that is in a case. And we're going to go over quite a few cases tonight. And I'm sorry, what was the gentleman's name? Well, he in here, he's he's got the name of Big Bird. Not okay. everybody comes in with their name, and that's all right. Okay. okay, so, okay, Big Bird. So what happens is, is that law enforcement, even to today, they still even test me. So, I mean, what they do is, if you've got anything that pertains inside of that file, they will check out every link. They have to check out every lead. Regardless, what gets thrown in, and that's why they always say, you know, we have bad leads. What so it takes so long to do a case and, and go back because they have to follow something in case it does look like it's part of that file. Um, it took a long time. Um, a lot of a lot of police officers call me. They call me mm-hmm. regularly on cases. 
Um, I take my wife on death scenes. We go because she's my pillar. Whenever I fly like to Maryland or to Washington or to, you know, go down to the States or what have you, um, she's there on every case with me. Yeah. Um, yeah, so you, you know, it comes yes. down to, and it boils down to how credible you are, how accurate you are, and it does your record. It does because when you solve one, where it gets out to the next police force and they recommend right. you, and it goes and it goes and it goes and it goes and goes. So, mm-hmm. you know, that's why I brought out that book. And then over the years from 1990 till now, it's 30 years, you got 15 cases that are in there that stipulate that. And then in that book, you have all law enforcement testimonials. You have the text messages. I put in yeah. stuff in there. I, I, I put stuff in that book that normal folks don't get to see. And yeah. I got the blessing from law enforcement. Our personal text messages, our personal uh, emails, uh, photos, um, reports, things that are in there that yeah. normal folks don't get a privy to. And it shows how the case started, how it went through, solved, and then the, the final detail to show that it actually was done. Uh, uh, just to let you know, Big Bird is a woman. I apologize. I did not know that. But uh, uh, just let everybody know the name of the book is Psychic Profiler, The Real Deal, True Crime, True Crime Cases, Volume 1. It's got Robbie's face right on the front. Um, it's it's a great book, a great guy. And you can find it on Amazon. Uh, is there any other place, Robbie, that you can find it? Oh, my goodness. You can go to your local bookstores, and they can order it in for you. It's, um, um, yeah, Books of Million. Um, I guess there's a lot of different online stores you can get at Barnes & Noble, stuff like okay. that. Yeah, yeah. Good. All right. Um, I guess my next question to you is, uh, what case that you solved what what case was there that you solved that made you the most satisfied and happy that that you had were able to help that you were able to to do what you do which one gave you the most joy wow um that's a very two part answer because we look at bringing people home i'm happy mm-hmm. right right i mean you, you, there's no sad there um putting a murderer away in jail for life, I'm happy. But then there's the sad part because a four year little boy was murdered. Right. Right. Um, let's, uh, let's answer it this way. I did a case in Kentucky, which is in the book. This is one I put in the book too. It was a day before Canada day. And I got a call from Kentucky from the liaison to the detective in Louisville, Kentucky. They said, could you help us please? A little four year old boy has gone missing. And I said, now here's where my wife comes involved here in the team, right? You're going to love this. <laughs> All right. You know, she's the boss. So you have to listen, right? Um, right. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. If I want dinner, I listen. Um, so, <laughs> so I said, no, I'm busy. I have folks in the backyard, and it's uh, the day before Canada Day. I'm sorry. No. I never say no. I don't know whatever came over me that day. I never say no. Never. And I hung up the phone, and I turned. She's right there in the doorway. And she goes, "You call them back, and the people can wait or go home." So, you know, it kind of like okay, right in my face. I said, "Yeah." So I did. I called back. They sent me the photograph. All I had was his name and his photograph on screen. I'm in Canada. They're in Louisville, Kentucky. All right. <laughs> so I started doing my channeling. I closed the office door. I'm doing my thing, and I'm getting right away uh, lights. And I draw four lights off stadium lights, and then I get down. Um, flags and um, men in orange vests, and I put those down too. And then I write down uh, repeat offender of two young boys. I put repeat offender of two young boys. So this is very detailed information. You know, it's it's not a tree of light. It's very detailed, right? So if you stood on the murderer's front porch and you looked right out his front door, they were actually doing construction right in front of this house, men with orange vests, and they had it all flagged off in front of his house. If you looked through the clearing across the street, Papa John Stadium. Stadium lights were there, and they were off that night. So that's what the stadium we're talking about. I put John, too. And also, this mm-hmm. diagram's on uh, folks want to follow, RobbieThomas.net, and you go to the murder yep, I person. I put that in the chat room. Oh, did you? Okay, so <laughs> yeah. they can follow this. Yeah, they can yeah. see what I drew. So then, um, repeat offender? Yeah, he sexually abused two other boys. 
and he he was out. I don't know why they let these guys out. I don't understand, but yeah, he was out. So then a bunch of other information, and then there was a break, and then I just didn't have anything, and I was upset, and it was like, yeah. what, what happened? And I'm trying to figure this out. It was a void. Then I kind of, I don't know, it was like a, a feeling, you know, like there's nothing good here happening, and then all of a sudden I got the boy talking, and I knew he was murdered. Yeah. And I was thinking, oh my gosh, he just did that now? And the, the boy's talking, he's showing me the picture of the man. I'm trying to draw this monster through the eyes of a four-year-old little boy really fast. And mm -hmm. this other stuff's coming in, and I'm still trying to draw. And if you look at his, his mugshot and his picture that I was showing, the pointy ears, the jawline, and all, it, it matches through the eyes of a four-year-old little boy. So I yeah. did what I could. And then I got mad, and I said, Dan, give me his name. And he did. He gave me Cecil. And I wrote Cecil, uh -huh. and I put the arrow down to the top of his head, and then that's the guy who did it. So all the information went in. It went down to, um, I think it was NBC in Louisville. The news team got it. The detective got it. And sure enough, they go and knock on this guy's door and ask him if he's seen the boy instead of going into the department or into where he lived and, and checking. But what he did was he held little C uh, Caesar down in the bathtub and drowned him. Mm. That's what I that's what mm. I was feeling. And the guy who got arrested December seventh was Cecil Eugene New. And he's in jail for yeah. life. Mm. Wow. Just oh some of the depravity that is out there is just unbelievable. Just upsetting. But, mm. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> but yeah, good that it was solve good that the parents have answers you know and that's yeah. i mean that's it's got to be hard you especially the ones that are abducted where they're still holding on they're still hoping and yet inside you you know there's not hope but you you want to give them answers but you really don't want to give them that one but you kind of have to to proceed forward uh yes <laughs> Yeah, it's a struggle it's, um, sometimes. It is because I mean, you look at the family and you look at the mom or the dad or, or, or other family members, and it's very disheartening when they're looking at you saying, "Bring me my baby back," or "Please do something," and you you just you're crushed inside for them. You know, it's right. I don't know. I don't know how else to you know say it. Um, one one case, and you know, it's all, it's always sad, but children. Um, yeah. Again, my family they're on they're on scene with me, and it's in it's in um, St. Thomas, Ontario, Canada, and we went down. I sat with Detective Brown and the family over numerous meetings and times in the precinct in the house. Um, my family got to meet their family. And the little girl was Victoria Stafford that went missing. A uh, very touching case because there's certain aspects of this case they asked me to do. Like one night they said, could you please, um, if, if Victoria's around, around us, uh, have her talk to you and let her explain if she's around us. And I come mm -hmm. home and I was, I was, I was commuting back and forth. And, you know, go down there all day and come back, right? And then just, I think it was like a two-hour drive for me. But I'm going back and forth. So I'm home one night, and I just fed up. I'm really fed up because of everything that we're so trying. We're so close. We're so close. And then all of a sudden, I just said, okay, Victoria, make a noise. And you hear knock, 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 knock of a little yeah. child on the wall. Five little knuckle knocks. And my wife pulls the covers over her head, and she said, what's that? And I said, that's Victoria. And I said, Victoria, show me something that only your dad and the family, Rebecca, the, uh, your aunt and everybody will know that you're around them. This is what they want. This is what they want. So she right. showed me a woman wearing a ball cap and then a fox head on top. Oh, okay, so I'm drawing real quick, right? Yeah. Getting all this down. Because I'm thinking more information is going to come as it usually does, but it didn't. It just seemed that picture. So I'm drawing all that, and there was nothing more. That was it. So I'm done. I, I, nothing more. Victoria's not around. We're done. So the next day, I call up the family. They have me on speaker, and Rebecca says, You know, I said, Rebecca, I got some stuff for you. What I, what you asked me to do, I did last night. And the knocking, and they went, Oh, and they said, 
Um, anything else? And I said, yes. She showed me a ball cap that a lady bought. And, but the funny thing is that it had like a, a stuffed fox head on top of this hat. And, she, <laughs> and then you hear, and then you hear, oh, like this, like sighs and, and oh my gosh, right? And then yeah. I hear in the back, I hear in the background, he just bought her that hat yesterday. It was fox <sighs> racing. The little emblem of oh, fox. Yeah. And, oh my gosh. Well, there you go. There's your answer. Yeah. They're around you. I mean, she's around you. And you know, it was, it was great because then that was just, I think it was midway through this case. And, you know, going through the, the motions of even being there when the father was doing his uh, lie detector test, and I was in the room mm-hmm. adjacent with one of the detectives, and it didn't go so well, but he was so nervous. I mean, he was so upset as his daughter, and obviously he didn't do it. All my information went in. It was a young, older guy and a younger woman, and the the pile of rocks with the rubble on top, the, the uh, actual wood, the tree line, the um, uh, laneway, the Mennonites, the horse and buggies, Everything went mm-hmm. down that way through was all exactly where we found Victoria Stafford. The thing about this case is that I drew all that two days before she went missing. I showed the program director of 99.9, wow. the Fox FM in my hometown. And we did a show and then he actually pulled me back in on the show and wanted to explain to people that, and in his words, I'm going to try to quote what he said, uh, something like, you know, you show me this stuff before they investigated and he goes mm-hmm. i can't believe it and he goes it all came true and he goes yeah. oh, i was a skeptic but he goes i'm a believer now yeah it, it happens that way sometimes when you're you're getting pulled in on a case and they don't want to tell you anything they don't want to contaminate but days prior you start stuff just starts coming in it has nothing to do with any other case or anything else you're you're researching and you're you just start journaling it and next thing you know pieces start coming together and then something happens you're like aha now i know where this goes it's right. it's crazy <laughs> it's crazy it's like the information finds you sometimes Right, right, so, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Well, Robbie, I have to take a little commercial break here. Uh, we'll be back in just a few minutes. So, everyone, you are listening to uh, Illuminating the Paranormal on Para-X with... Our- for everything paranormal para x hey this is lee and this is michelle and this is dustin from the dead zone your source for everything paranormal para x sacred cauldron. This is the legendary artifact that has been whispered about in hushed tones for hundreds of years, and now it's mine! All mine! (laughs) Who dares defile the sanctity of my castle walls? Step away from the cauldron, you impertinent, muddy metal malt worm. Never! I've spent half my lifetime trying to discover your age-old secret of stirring the cauldron! Oh, for Merlin's sake, that's no deep, dark secret. Just tune into the Para-X Radio Network Thursday nights at 9 o'clock Eastern for more cauldron stirring than you can shake a wand at. Oh, well, uh, in that case, I, I guess I don't need to take up any more of your time, so I, I guess I'll be going. Not just yet. We've got a little unfinished business to take care of. That's Stirring the Cauldron with Marla Brooks every Thursday night at 9 p.m. Eastern on the Para-X Radio Network. 
And welcome back, everyone, to Illuminating the Paranormal. My name is Tina Marie, and my guest tonight is Robbie Thomas. You know, Robbie has 10 books out. Uh, some of his books are Signs from Heaven, Paranormal Encounters, To You from Spirit, Time Shift, The Paradigm, Dreaming, a complete look at recording and interpreting dreams, A Link to Heaven, Parasylum, Parasylum 2, Parasylum 3, and the one he's been referencing the most tonight is The Psychic Profiler, The Real Deal, True true Crime Cases. Well, I don't know why I'm having trouble with that tonight. And you can find these on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, pretty much any book deal you go into. Just ask for a Robbie Thomas book. If they don't have it, they can order it for you. For you. Uh, you can also go to his website. It's www.robbythomas.net. And then that way you guys can see um, a lot of the different things that he has up there. He, You have quite a few different places that you're going to be touring this year. Isn't that correct? Oh, that's right. Yeah. You know, I... Um what I did 10 years ago was I set out on the Psychic Justice Tour, and I started out in my hometown. And, you know, this is great because some of these cases that I did back then are in the book as well. Um, this lady was told for 14 years that her husband was dead behind a jail in Mexico and not bothered to look for, for him. So for 14 years, this whole family, the mom, everybody was told this man was dead. She called me up and I said, well, I'm going to be in, um, on stage at the Imperial theater. Uh, why don't you come out there? And she goes, well, we already know that he's dead. And I said, I'll, 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 I'll read. Okay. I'll read you there. She goes, yeah. okay. So I said, give me his photo. She gave me his photo. I had to call her back a couple of days later. And I said, I need you to do homework before we go on stage. I said, you better get a hold of the OPP, which will in turn get a hold of the RCMP. Um, he's not dead. He's alive. And she's like, what? Wow. what? And I said, yeah. But she was told by a psychic that he was dead, right? So, mm. uh, you know, um, 14 years is a long time and, and what have you to go through this. So she did her homework. Sure enough, she's on stage. She's ready now. She's like, oh, she's antsy. She wants to tell me. And I said, you just hang tough. We get on stage and the curtains open up and it was a packed house in my hometown. So mm -hmm. I went through the emotions of explaining a lot of different things, different cases. And then I'm, she's sitting comfortably in a chair and I turned to her and I said, okay, now this is case number one tonight. And this is what we're going to do folks. And I introduced her and I went through the motions and I said, you, you had homework. What happened? She goes, they told us it was a matter of privacy. And I thought, oh, 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 right there, I just know. I was right. He's alive. Yeah. And yeah. in the area, Canada, he was out in British Columbia where we found <sighs> him. And the police did locate him. So all I hear is, and that's what they told us, too. And I looked out in the <laughs> audience, and I'm saying, where did that come from? And the light was on me on stage, being down at this beautiful elderly lady about eight rows up. I asked the lady on stage for the mic. I jumped down. I ran up to the lady about eight rows up, and it was his mom. So I got, I got his <sighs> wife on stage, and mom and audience. Mom did not know that the wife was going to be on stage, and the, and the wife did not know that the mom was going to be there. They were estranged from each other. So oh. I went, yeah. So I went over to her and I said, what did you just say? And she says, it's a, it's a, it's a matter of privacy. It's a privacy issue. And I said, yeah. And she goes, he's out there. I said, yes. So we found him alive after 14 years and he doesn't want to be found. He just wants to be left alone. So, and there's a lot of people out there who are like that which people yeah. really don't know that, but it's true. Um, so at least we know he's alive. So that was case number one. That's in the book. It's more detail about everything. I went really quick for everybody to get a little synopsis. Yeah. Um, but during that 2010, I went down through like Ohio, worked with U.S. Marshals, um, uh, Iowa, um, Indiana. I did two in Indiana, Kentucky, and then uh, up here in Canada to Toronto, and then my own hometown. And then now... You're right. I'm going on tour again. I do a lot of tours, but this is based on cases. And some of those cases from back then, I'm bringing forward to show everybody. But then in between, too, a lot of different cases. And as you and I spoke prior to the show, I'm going to be doing a workshop and showing people my strategies, my methods, my 
my techniques and what law enforcement endorsed me for. They openly endorsed me from all levels of law enforcement. I worked with the FBI, CIA. Um, you know, we'll get into the case of the CIA in a moment here. And, yeah. you know, it's how do you get like that and how, you know, it's again, it's, it's over time and proving yourself time in and time again, time again, and time again on cases. So then I'm going to be bringing real case files after my workshop of, of doing my presentation and making people work their butts off. They're all going to have fun. <laughs> and I'm going to have real case files, and I'm going to put them on screen. It's going to be like I was in Washington, or sorry, Maryland when I went down with the DSA. I worked with the NSA, and it was a CIA agent's daughter that went missing. And they handed me a map. I come off of Ronald Reagan Airport with my wife, and we get into the, the secretive building, and they patch you down, and you go through all these beeping machines. And I'm sitting there, and he goes, here's suspect A and suspect B, we think. And I'm looking at these two guys. Here's victim A. I'm looking at victim, and they hand me a map, and they go, finder. That's all they wow. say. Here's map of Maryland and Virginia. Finder. Ugh. So that's what it's like to work with police. They don't Ooh. tell you anything, so people think... They watch NSI or whatever on TV and, you know, and, and all these other shows. And they go, they wait till it's all dramatized out. And they go, oh, I knew he did it. Oh, I know she did. Yeah. It's totally <laughs> different when you're on scene, folks. It's a map. And that's all you get of two big, yeah. huge states. So yeah. then I go back to the, um, they escort us back to the hotel room. I'm kind of like ticked because it was a long delayed flights getting there. And, and it wasn't a matter of them. It was the situation and looking at this beautiful lady who was missing. So I take the map. I cracked a beer. I took a drink. My wife looks at me, and I did my thing. I circled a little road by Andrews Air Force Base, and I threw the map down. And she goes, you're done? And I said, I'm done. She goes, you can't be. Homer's going to be mad. I said, no. <laughs> Detective Homer ain't going to be mad. I said, I'm done. And she's like, okay. So the next day, we get the escort us back to the DSA's office. We go through the same thing. There's everybody sitting there. Uh, now the NSA guy's there, um, and the CIA agent's uh is 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 there that week for her daughter so we're looking at all this stuff they found the car in virginia it was washed I meaning it was bleached and yeah, that's the yeah. fbi guy found it so um he looks at the map because get my car so i get in his car and we get downstairs get in his car wife and i and we're driving around he goes is it here is it over here and we take another 10 minute drive it was over here and i said homer stop the car i said and he stops the car and he goes get out so i get out crosses his arms, he leans on the car, and he goes, I don't know how you did it. I don't know how you do it. He goes, but all your notes you sent me before coming to America, you Canadian? This is what he says to me, right? Yeah. We got a lot. We got a lot good. Don't get me wrong, folks. We got a lot really good. He goes, he goes, that's the road I've been looking at for two years. And he goes, there's no way you would have known that little road by the Air Force Base and her phone pinged off that tower and pinged off that tower. And so we went through the motions. The dog team came out and everything. We found a bag. So his tools were missing. So we found a bag with flip phones, a uh, murder weapon, um, mm. a, top, a blo um, chain, flip flops, and some other things. Right? So that's part of that case. I said she was wrapped up in a blanket, red blanket, 100 feet from the road. So mm -hmm. now we're doing our thing. The dogs are trying to find. They had a couple of hits. And it was raining. It was like flooding in there. So they had to wait. So I come back home now. Oh, wait a minute. There's another part to this case. I got asked to go to Washington when I was there. But prior to um, going to Washington, uh, we did a little bit more work. And then I'm home. I'll bring you back to Washington in a second. So I'm home, and I get a phone call a year to the very day. And it's um, the mom, the CIA agent. Mm -hmm. You found her. You found her. You were right. She was wrapped in a red blanket 100 feet from the road. Wow. And, and oh. it was amazing and, and all this. And I'm going, oh, my gosh. She goes, but we have to do dental records because she's so decomposed. And I said, mm -hmm. okay. So we waited about two, three weeks. And then the phone came in and goes, she goes, oh, my gosh. You didn't find her. You found somebody else's baby that's been missing. So now I did <sighs> only two cases that day. A one for her daughter and one for somebody else's beautiful baby that was missing, wrapped in a red blanket. And I tell folks, I say, that was Catherine who was missing, helping out from the other side to bring home somebody else who was missing for another family. That's how it works. Wow. So we got that one. So now we're back Good. We're back to the field where we're leaving to go to the airport, and there's a call on the, on the radio. Uh, we know he's in town. Can we borrow him? So Homer looks at me and goes, <laughs> Do you want to stay another few days? We'll pick up the tab again and do everything. And I said, I looked at Leisha. Leisha goes, okay. So we stayed. So the escort is all the way up in the Washington area, right? And now um, 
she um a being pulled on scene and it looked like million dollar homes but like out of a movie of et we go around this cul-de-sac and this all these beautiful homes everywhere and just cop cars everywhere diggers there's diggers all over they've been digging since 1991 wow. the, the, the main boss of this bike gang shot stabbed had sex with this girl put her in um a red sleeping bag and buried her and <laughs> he did it with um footage and while well, he killed her and then the other biker guys turned state's evidence against him Right. So while he's in the slammer, he's got a note with all their names with check marks where he wants to bump off all these guys. Right. So they find this on the sweep and then they've been digging since 91 because they want to keep him in there. His time is coming to the end and Uh they're digging everywhere, all over the place. And I went in there and I'm looking at all these beautiful blue liners and they're all distraught because the last dig got some charred remains of bones and they had to send them off for DNA analysis, but they didn't believe it was human bones. Right. Right. So he says to me, you tell me one thing you're on scene here on my scene. You tell me one thing that I'll believe that you're real. And then I'll let you stay on my scene. I look at Homer and Homer's just smiling. Right. And I know Homer's thinking, Homer's thinking, well, he found my stuff. I'm sure that, you know, he'll find yours. Right. So I'm sitting there and I'm just thinking, Oh my gosh, like nothing like, pressure or being put on the spot yeah oh okay well you know what i i I feel there's something on top of her and his eyes went up and i said it's not it's like not like um cement or anything it's like a tank and he hugged me he ripped the patches off his arms and i've put them on facebook sometimes i say this is what you get when you go on scene sometimes right (laughs) i've posted this sometimes and he hands them to my wife and then he goes where and I said, do you have photos, like aerial photos? And so the younger guy, he runs down to the car, comes back with his envelope, and I swear there's dust on it. And he opens it up, and there's all these black and white photos from, like, 1986, right? It used to be farmland. And there was a trailer about, say, on this one side area facing another trailer, which would have been about 100, 100 yards away. And that was the sister's trailer. So he had a trailer. She had a trailer. He owned this land. And I took that photograph, and I turned it about 30 degrees and said watch the topography of the land i said that is the crick right there there's the crick in the photograph and we're looking okay. down at this I said there's his trailer and there i said her trailer so can you show me where her trailer would have been so the young guy runs and he goes over he goes it would have been right about over here and i said where would a septic tank be and so john the older fellow starts <sighs> running and he's running over there, too. And you can see where they've dug all over the place but this one little area. And yeah. over there, in the, right? and there's this iron um, rod um, fencing. It goes about in square. It goes, I would say, 12 feet by 12 feet by 12 feet. And there's a tree in the middle, and it has vegetation all around. And it's in front of this one house. And it's, I said to him, what happens to a septic tank when, like, over that kind of long time? Yeah. Goes, it, would de- it would decay. And so I said, look at the ground. And you see it crumbles. So, and the tree yeah. is like sinking down. And he goes, you're kidding. He goes, point. And I went, I just point at it. And he goes, do it again. <laughs> so I don't know why, but I, I pointed again. And he hugged me again. And he called me brother. And he goes, that's the only place we never done. And he goes, oh, he goes, I have to get warrants now. And then as I turn around, there's a lady in the window of her home. And she's shaking her head. No, no. She didn't want her yard dug up, right? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But um, so, yeah. Yeah, the adventures of doing this. Um, but yeah, crazy. so there's like two things that are, are crazy. Um, I know. Well, Robbie, I do have a cool, uh, big bird who we now know is a woman. She's a fellow Canadian like you. Oh, and God. she wants hey. to know, do you ever come, <laughs> do you ever come to Peterborough? Peterborough. Um, only a long time ago playing hockey. Um, no, but I don't go to Peterborough whatsoever. Unfortunately, okay. yeah, they get more um, snow than we do. It. <laughs> oh, <laughs> now I, I want to move away from snow. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Uh, Big Bird also would like to know: Do you feel? Uh, now, this is her asking. Uh, does he feel like me that some cases are not meant to be solved by certain people, and that the dead will only direct that information to to you know who they choose to give it to? That it's it's not always going to come to everybody. It's going to come to the person that they feel would be the right person to solve it. 
Yeah, in a sense, yeah, I'm going to try to answer this in, in the way that I know best. Um, I used to think that way along those lines about 20 years ago. And what is the best analogy I can give is this. I don't go looking. I don't ambulance chase. I never have because law enforcement always call me and family mm-hmm. always call me in conjunction with law enforcement. When asked, it's almost like it has to be that preservation of that question or that plea, if you will, to ask and everything kicks in. Mm-hmm. I, I don't chase it. And if something happens, I don't sit there and dwell on it. I can't anymore. You know, here's, here's yeah. a great answer too. I told you I did four cases just before Christmas, right? My yeah. email, I get about on an average of 12 to maybe 20 cases a month that come into mm-hmm. my house, my office. Um, then I get asked like on shows, can you help? Can you help? So you add those all up. Then I get the calls from law enforcement that are totally different. Um, yeah. So I'm, I don't have a chance to even, you know, look at different cases anymore or anything whatsoever and doing the tour and then being asked about a, you know, I've been in negotiations for my own television series for since 2011. I shot with America's Most Wanted in 2011 on a double homicide in Butcher's Holler. My partner was International Police Chief Kevin Smith, and it was um, Lamport okay. Shepherd from Toronto. So, you know, looking at that and being busy like that, it, it's it's difficult. So when they, you know, if they're wanting to be found or the case is supposed to be, it has to come initiative of somebody asking that's how I feel. Okay. All right. Um, now we are down to like another five minutes. So I, it's, I know this is a big question, but let's do as much as you can in five minutes. Okay. Um, how do you deal with what you see? I mean, I mean, there's, there's times when you see it that you can't unsee it anymore. It, it's there. Yeah. Um, I pray to my, my, my Lord and Savior is Jesus Christ, and I pray to God all the time. And I'll give you a great example real quick, okay? I'm in Virginia doing the wrap-up um, 2007, as you probably know, with Keith Age doing coexistence of TV uh, paranormal, the most haunted places in America. I get there on Friday. I get a text message. My husband has been declared brain dead. They're going to unplug him. Can you help or do you know anybody who can do what you do? And I said, I don't. I really don't. I can't think off the top of my head and anybody in, in our area that could do that. I'm sorry. Um, if, they, if the neurologist will wait, I'll be back on Tuesday. And so, you know, miracle, they waited. And so we filmed Friday, Saturday, Sunday, we were done. And we drove 12 hours straight back to my hometown. And I met Julie in the ICU, went in. She hugged me, opened the secret code to get inside the ICU. There's her husband, plugged in every machine you could think, tubes coming everywhere out of every orifice, and three IVs. And I just took my hat off and started praying to God. And I said, either you tell me because Julie's sitting here and the ICU is staring at me inside yeah. the, the doorway. And the doctors, and they're thinking, okay, we waited for this, right? And I'm just tired, right, from driving 12 hours. And yeah. all of a sudden, I started, started hearing. They give me the wrong medicine. My brain is swollen. And it's going to take time for me to heal. He said it twice. I turn, I put my hat back on. I turned to Julie. She says, no good. She started crying. I said, no, I hugged her. And I said, this is what they told me. You're going to have to tell the doctor. And then what I, what I just told you, I told her. And then I went home. And then about, I'd say maybe half an hour, text messages were coming. My phone was ringing. And poop hit the fan. And the doctor pulled the chart. And he said, oh, my gosh, pull the IVs. We're giving him the wrong medicine. It's swelling his brain. And that's what he told me. In his coma, and they were going to unplug him and kill him. And wow. what happened is short and sweet is I pray to God all the time. And that's a great example to give you because now Bill is alive and he's healthy like you and me. He runs around with his dogs and he's got his wife. And at that moment, they were going to kill him, but he's alive. And that's one of the stories in the book more in depth with Julie's letter and, and explains everything as well. Wow. And I do remember you talking about that one before. That was quite quite interesting to hear all of that right. uh, if any 
if anybody wants to find out where Robbie's going to be, about all of his books and everything he's doing, you can go to uh, www.robbythomas.net and uh, check him out there. He's going to be quite a few different places on tour. Like I said, you got 10 books out there and this great one that just that's just out, The Psychic Profiler, The Real Deal, True Crime Cases, Volume 1. So you are coming out with a second one, I'm assuming. Yeah, and you know the funny thing with being in negotiations and everything with uh, Emmy Award winning directors and everything, you got to hold tight because when you do exclusivity contracts, you are you know tight, right? So right. in in the future, you people will see a lot more from me because there's so many cases. Good, good. You know we. Do have one more quick question. I think I can quick get it in here. Uh, again, it's from our good friend Big Bird. She wants to know: Was he shown Trudeus rigged election like I was shown? I seen people running around all over Ontario, placing the stuffed boxes in all the polling stations. <laughs> no, um, no. <laughs> um, yeah, we need to get rid of him. By the way. Uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, we don't want him here. Um, no, it's. Um, no, I've never seen anything like that. Um, you know, real quick. I don't know how much time. How much time do we have? Uh, you are down to two minutes. Two okay, and a half minutes. Quick. I was writing the book Time Shift. It was a play. And it was actually a, a script for Mark Tillman did the original it with Stephen King. He did MacGyver, Robocop, all those big shows. So I'm writing out this this, this um, script, movie script, and I was being shown all these premonitions, which I thought was part of the, the script. I was right. I didn't realize. But a lot of things came true. And people go to the website and take a look at all came true. The biggest one that came true was the 9.0 earthquake off of Japan. I wrote that a week before it happened and also mentioned it all on Facebook back in March. You can go back in March and, and see all the inclusions I did and it's all in there. So things like that have come um, and, and it's all date stamped and, and, and done. But yeah, um, I wish I would have seen about Trudeau. I could have warned everybody. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and yeah, I, I believe it. there's, there's a lot of us that, and I'm sure big bird, you're probably one of them too, where we get that, antsy feeling we're like oh something's coming something's coming but we don't quite know what uh some of us get an, an extra little premonition and know what but usually you know if it's something that big it's not always enough time to do anything about it so unfortunately oh it happens so it does yep and so now where is the first place you're going to be on your tour I'm opening up in Canada, Windsor, Ontario, at the Alexander McKenzie Hall. I scoot over to Detroit, to the 6th Precinct. From there, we're going to Licking Jail in Ohio, and then Crown Point Jail in Indiana. And I'm finishing up in Philadelphia at Fort Mifflin. Uh, now, I want to go to Crown Point Jail. I thought I had been there before, but when I looked back through my notes, I had confused it with the Hartford City Jail. I definitely want to go to uh, Crown Point, and I have told you about Hartford City, so I want you to hit that place sometime if you can. Uh, I have been to Fort Mifflin. Man, are you going to have a good night. Oh, good. that place is awesome. Fantastic. So. <laughs> So, yes, please check out Robbie Thomas at www.robbythomas.net. He is also on Facebook. Get his book, The Psychic Profiler, The Real Deal, True Crime Cases, Volume 1. Volume 2 is currently being written, and it will be out when, as soon as he can get it out. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, if you guys want to ask questions or if you are looking for a certain person to be on the show and you want to know more about the show, you can always find me on Facebook at Illuminating the Paranormal and also my other three companies, Nature's Earthwear, Heirloom Haberdashery, and Three Sisters Smudging. They are all on Facebook. You can catch me there. And, oh, guys, what a night. I can't believe that we are down to just one minute left. Oh, it's just crazy. Just unbelievable. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
So, um, let me see here. Who do I have for next week? I know I have somebody all set up and ready to go. Let's see. Next week, ah, next week is Paranormal Investiga- Investigator Chris Nielsen, and he is a really good guy. You guys will like him. So, all right, guys. I am getting ready to head out here. Robbie, thank you again so very, very much. I greatly appreciate all that you have done and all that you continue to do and you're a great guy and i don't know when i'm going to get a chance to see you next yeah you know um we'll have to set something up and get me back on or what have you yep. and uh yeah we'll go i'll from probably there. have breaking news you know coming okay so. uh, we're looking forward to it all right guys you have been listening to illuminating the paranormal and we will see you 